So this is the first time that we've seen him dig a little bit. Perhaps he's getting out of that initial state of shock. So Arena calls the Katama Shores Motor Inn. Remember, there were keys in the handbag, so he knows where they're staying. And he asked to speak to Rosemary Keo. Keo sounded wary and suspicious after Arena identified himself as chief of police. He overheard a muffled consultation going on at the other end of the line. It didn't occur to Arena until later that from the tremulous quaver in her voice, Rosemary Keough had known about the death of Mary Jo Kopechny. Welcome back to my channel. I'm Jess Cannell, and we are going through Leo Demore's book, Chappaquiddick power, privilege, and the Ted Kennedy cover-up. We've already been through the chronology that our book starts out with, the forward introduction, and chapters one through four. Today, we are going to get through chapters five through seven. Before we get into this, I just want to say, last episode, I did a quick review of what we had discovered in the previous chapters. I'm going to go ahead and do a quick review again today, hopefully even quicker than that one. But what I wanna hear from you guys is, would you like for me to just do a quick, like one minute recap at the start of every one of these? Or are you already committed to this and you just wanna go ahead and get into the reading? I just wanna do what's helpful for you. And I think sometimes with a book like this, it could be helpful to go ahead and review the key facts so that we all come into it remembering those things. So that's my reason for doing it. Okay, the first thing that we need to note is that this is not the first party of the Boiler Room Girls. Um, and the first one was held about a year prior, six weeks after RFK's assassination had happened. These ladies had all worked for Senator Robert F. Kennedy. And so this was a situation where they were regathering for a few days um, to spend time out on the Cape. In chapter one, he laid out the specifics of how the accident was discovered. And then Chief Arena, he's the police chief of the nearby town, Edgartown. He dove down couldn't get to the car, but we see the diver get in and we see the diver find Mary Jo. And so we went through those details. So if you did not listen to that, that's a really important episode, episode one. Chapters two through four, what we got is a good look at Ted Kennedy's early movements. It raised questions for me and many of you viewers said the same about, did Ted Kennedy know about the accident before he met with two men on the ferry that morning. It's unclear. Some people said perhaps he has some sort of drunken blackout situation where he literally had forgotten or had not retained that information. But we have a period of time where he goes from seemingly calm and cheery to panicked, and stressed out and he immediately books it to the police chief's office and he reports the accident and we got the entire report there. So that's episode two. This is episode three and we're gonna go ahead and get started with chapter five. In chapter four, Senator Kennedy has just left the police office. And so police chief arena is left with the reporters he told reporters that were allowed into the corridor. So now he's let the, now that Senator Kennedy is out of the building, he has let the reporters in. He told reporters he could not release a statement about the accident from Senator Kennedy until he received permission. James Reston, who is a hardcore journalist from the New York Times, he had also purchased a local paper so he had local stake in the ground for what was happening in this. And then also he had the instincts of a New York Times editor that he could smell that this was a big story. Furious that the police had collaborated with the Senator to avoid confronting reporters, James Reston demanded the statement be released at once. Arena politely declines to do so. He's still bothered that there's just a blank space where the victim's name should be. He thought he had the name. Remember, Rosemary Keogh's little handbag was found in the vehicle, in the passenger's seat. And so it seemed 
to him and to everyone that the body that was found was Rosemary Keogh. So he didn't know until Ted comes to the office that the body was actually the body of Mary Jo Kopechny. And so James Arena is feeling embarrassed that the statement doesn't have this critical information. He's holding it back. It says the handbag that he had brought back to the police station from the accident scene inspired the only investigative initiative Arena would find time to demonstrate in the escalating pressurized atmosphere at Town Hall. It had not seemed out of line for the handbag to be found in the accident car since Rosemary Keogh was identified as a Senate employee. In fact, her Senate employee badge was in her little handbag. And so it didn't seem out of place. And Arena just said that lulled me into thinking she's just one of Kennedy's crew that maybe there's a bunch of girls here from Washington, and if Mary Jo was in the regatta group staying at the motel, then this other girl has got to know her. And so this is the first time that we've seen him dig a little bit. Perhaps he's getting out of that initial state of shock that we observed him to potentially be in. So Arena calls the Katama Shores Motor Inn. Remember, there were keys in the handbag, so he knows where they're staying. And he asked to speak to he Rosemary. He tells us why he was calling. He's not calling to investigate Rosemary or the handbag or any of that. He's calling to find out, how do I spell Mary Jo's last name? That's what he wants to know. Keo sounded wary and suspicious after Arena identified himself as chief of police. He overheard a muffled consultation going on at the other end of the line before Keo came back on to spell out Mary Jo Kopechny's name. Keo was sending someone else to the police station to pick up her handbag for her, she told him. So Arena turns it over to a man, quote, who looked reputable an hour later. He didn't question the man. Quote, maybe I gave it away too easy, you what bag to ask for? And there was nothing compromising in the bag. Have y'all ever seen the movie Charade? I just want to say, sometimes there are compromising things in a handbag that aren't initially identifiable as that. Sometimes there are things that are clues or give indications that are significant. And so this is, for my taste, not just because of Charade, but because this is one of the only identifying pieces of information in the car, and it links potentially this accident to someone that we don't know anything about. To me, he turns this handbag over way too easily. And I also wa wonder why she didn't come herself. I mean, I think I know. I think we get this answered later. I think they're being hustled away, but it bothers me that she wouldn't come. It didn't occur to Arena until later that from the tremulous quaver in her voice, Rosemary Keogh had known about the death of Mary Jo Kopechny. She seemed very down in the dumps, he said, like she knew what was happening. I'm thinking she's way out in Katama and I'm down here. How the hell does she know about the accident? So the car accident was on one end of Chappie. The ferry, the Chappie Ferry that goes back and forth between Chappaquiddick and Edgar Town was on the opposite side of the island. And then Katama Shores Motor Inn, which is no, no longer there, but has become a different resort, is about 11 minutes south of the Chappie Ferry. So he's up here, he's been going back and forth, and it's perhaps early afternoon. He's going, she's out here. She hasn't been a part of any of this investigation she wasn't even mentioned except for the handbag. Ted Kennedy doesn't say anything about her. How does she know that she's already dead? Because nobody was at the scene of the accident. Ted Kennedy seemed to know because he was the driver. But how does she know? It was too late for Keo to be questioned. When he finally thinks of this question and he calls the motel again, she had already checked out. Arena didn't get to question Ted Kennedy's chauffeur either. This driver was an older man who had this job of driving Ted Kennedy around for evenings and weekends. And he had done this job for some time, for many years. Jack Crimmins is his name. He wasn't sure what Ted Kennedy's driver was doing hanging out at the police station just after the Senator left. I thought maybe he's with Ted and just waiting around to see me or 
that he was there to put the arm on me, to say, hey, go easy on the boss. Or did he want to tell me something? When Arena went out to the corridor looking for him, Crimmins was gone. Arena's only source of information about the accident was Senator Kennedy's report. <laughs> you guys, Arena's lack of curiosity, his lack of quick thinking, his pressure in the moment, the stress, completely flubbed several elements of this critical point in the investigation. The handbag, handed over without issue. Rosemary Keo, he actually gets in touch with her. She knows about the accident and he doesn't even put it together until he's off the phone with her. And when he tries to reach out again, she's unreachable. Jack Crimmins, he's there hanging around. Even after Ted Kennedy leaves, Jack Crimmins is still there. Arena is bustling around and, and doesn't get to it. And then he, he fritters away. So Arena's only source of information is this statement. And if you haven't watched it yet, I'm just gonna make another plug. The Chappaquiddick Life Magazine episode that I did, I will link to it in the show notes, is fantastic because they take the statement. I had not expected this. I didn't know what to expect when I opened the article, but this goes line by line through his statement and shows the absurdity of various elements and how they contradict one another or they contradict known information. And so that is so worth seeing. It's not a long episode and it's worth your time if you're interested in this topic. He starts to realize and Walter Steele starts to realize the statement doesn't add up at all. Look at the map. The supposed wrong turn was particularly contradictory. Kennedy was familiar enough with the geography of Chappaquiddick to know that you bear a hard left to get to the ferry instead of turning right onto Dyke Road. It's also clear that the hard left is paved. The road to the right is dirt. It's easy enough to identify which one goes to the ferry and which one goes out to this old bridge. He also finds in question the shock and exhaustion that Kennedy said he had suffered after the accident. The Senator had not sought any medical attention after the accident. In fact, he had been hopping on and off ferries and seeming to get around just fine. The reporter who tries to get a photo of him gets him in mid kind of kind of a quick pace. He bustles in, he's moving around. No one who saw him that morning says he, he seemed to be achy or he was holding himself different or nothing. And this is a man with known back problems. He wore a brace. It was a big deal. He almost was paralyzed. So for him to be bustling around here, there, and everywhere is a big deal. He showed no signs of injury at the police station. Jim Arena starts to think that this was all an effort to avoid responsibility, that the reason he had delayed reporting was to get out of responsibility for the accident. As it was, Kennedy hadn't done so until after the accident was discovered by others and after a body had been recovered from his car. Unless there were mitigating circumstances to account for the 10 hour delay, Arena had no choice but to seek a complaint against Ted Kennedy for leaving the scene of an accident. Steele told him, that's all you can do. The statement is in clear violation of this statute. So he has Walter Steele counseling him through this situation and giving him the legal perspective. And he says, this statement doesn't hold up. You, you don't wait 10 hours to report an accident where you know somebody's in it. Steele thinks it's completely absurd that Arena had been asked to hold the statement until it had been cleared by Kennedy's lawyer. He says, you can't release this to the press. It's a confession. He uses curse words that I'm not going to use. They can't want this made public. Steele wants to know if the DA's office has been notified. Arena says, I called George Killen. This is where the little handy guide of who is who in the front really comes in handy. So just so you know, Walter Steele is the special prosecutor. George Killen is the state police detective lieutenant. He's in charge of the Cape Cod office of the DA. So he's in the DA's office, but he is not the DA. Steele wants to know, did you notify the DA? He says, well, I notified a guy in the DA's office and he says, the statute says you have to notify the DA. 
let's not take any chances. That guy is an SOB. So Edmund Dennis is the DA for the Southern District. He only gave the part of Kennedy's statement in which the Senator had admitted to driving the car. Dennis did not take it well. We are in this case right now, he shouted. He's all done, he's gone. Okay. Arena realizes, oh, the DA is already onto this case. Dennis had authority to take over any investigation with his, within his district merely by announcing his intention to do so. So Arena starts to go, wow, this is big. George Killen calls him though and says, this is just a motor vehicles case. You must have had a hundred of these things when you were the state police. You don't need our help. And Killen offers the DA's assistance, but he says, it's your case. So they are bandying back and forth of who is, who is investigating, who is taking up this case. So Dennis just said, it's our case. We're in it. Killen, who's the detective, the police detective lieutenant is saying it's still your case. Irina said Killen was right in some respects to think this was a state trooper kind of thing. It wasn't the kind of classic case you call the DA's office about. My reaction was with somebody like Ted Kennedy mixed up in it, if I didn't let Dennis know about the accident, he'd go crazy. As the senior officer responsible for the investigation and prosecution of all criminal matters on Cape Cod and the islands of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, Killen had achieved near legendary status. So Killen is perceived as reserved, strict adherence to principles. He carefully carries out high standards for investigative procedure. He had a small investigative staff and he carefully led them. Killen was in the middle of a very sensational murder case. And so he is not political. He's not coming at this from a political angle. Dennis is, of course, his adrenaline is rushed and he says, we're in it now. But Killen says, this is still a motor vehicle accident. It's yours. Killen calls Lieutenant Bernie Flynn. This is a veteran detective police officer, and he had jumped at the chance to work on investigations in Cape Cod. He calls this Lieutenant Bernie Flynn and says, there's been an accident. This is Killen calling Flynn. An accident? We don't investigate accidents. We'll investigate this one, Killen said. It's Ted Kennedy. You better get over to Edgartown and see what the hell is going on. Killen also contacted the state police barracks about an autopsy request made by Mills. Remember the medical examiner, Donald Mills, had basically punted the decision to others. He said, note that I'm satisfied with my diagnosis that this was death by drowning. But if somebody else insists on having an autopsy, then in that case, let it be known that I'll request one. So he's kind of leaving it to others to make the decision. Killen contacts the state police um, about the autopsy request and Mills was attending a patient when the call comes in. So a message is left for Mills. If you're satisfied with the diagnosis and there's no evidence of foul play, no autopsy is necessary. Should Mills care to discuss the matter further, he could call Killen directly and that number was given. Mills was perfectly satisfied with Lieutenant Killen's decision. And he goes ahead and instructs Eugene Free, who is the mortician, to go ahead with embalming. Remember, Free had been there at the site of the body. He is the mortician who's now going to be doing the embalming. Killen suggested that a blood specimen be taken for identification and analysis. That's important. Mills then has a baby to deliver at the hospital. And so he puts it out of his mind. Free, the mortician, is surprised that no autopsy has been ordered in the case. I figured there should have been one for three reasons, he says. The type of accident it was, the important people involved, and the fact that the insurance companies would be hounding officials over double indemnity claims. Free and his assistant undressed the body in a basement preparation room. A blood sample was drawn from abdominal compression 
free observed a very slight bit of moisture and a slight bit of froth of a pinkish hue. He estimated this to be less than a teacup. I did raise an eyebrow in the sense that I was expecting much more moisture. This is his assessment of seeing the body. Remember, we are highly dependent on really three men's word about what the body was like. We have first the diver, Farrar, who told us that the body was positively buoyant. He already found it in the state of rigor mortis. He told us about the body position. I'll put that up here. Then we have Mills. Mills was the medical examiner who did the look over of her body. He found no signs of trauma or injury. Everything seemed buttoned up and appropriate. Her clothing was not in disarray. He diagnoses death by drowning. And then we have Free, who observed the entire thing and is finding less moisture than he expected for a drowning case. For all of these men, it's not their first rodeo. The one is a trained and seasoned search and rescue diver. The one is a medical examiner who does lots of deaths by drowning. This is not his first time to encounter a body like this. And the mortician has also, he knows what a drowning victim looks like. So all three of these are giving us their best information and not without prior knowledge of other drowning situations. Free examined the scalp when he shampooed the salt water and seaweed from the victim's hair. Because the car had gone over a bridge, Free wondered if there might be some other injury that Dr. Mills had overlooked. Remember, he couldn't even pull off the pants. So Free discovers no bruises or marks on the body except for a slight abrasion on the left hand knuckle. So on, on a knuckle, he finds a slight abrasion. After washing the body, Free cleaned all body orifices with an astringent, but he put off embalming because he still expected Dr. Mills to change his mind about wanting an autopsy. Free held everything in abeyance, awaiting identification of the body and specific instructions from the deceased's family when he received a call from the Keelty Funeral Home of Plymouth, Pennsylvania. The only question I had about this is that the time frame of when this is happening is not clear to me. We're not given a, by now it was nearing dinner time or Free was nearing the end of his day after an exhausting day. We don't know if this is 2 p.m., 10 p.m. This feels really unclear timing to me. Free was told to prepare the remains and forward the body to Pennsylvania as quickly as possible. Keelty also provides the vital statistics that Free needs to make out the death certificate. So he gives the name, the full name, Mary Jo Kopechny, her address in Washington, D.C., that she was born in Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. She was formerly employed as a secretary to the late Senator Robert Kennedy. All of this information had been given by Gwen Kopechny, Mary Jo's mother. He uses a large hollow needle to remove any excess body fluids that might be detrimental to good embalming. And then he does the embalming. Free carefully recorded all procedures to keep ourselves refreshed in case we had to be questioned. I just wanna say the same thing that has happened to me, sometimes when you watch the Zapruder film, there's this like, <gasps> we watch with the hope that everything's gonna end differently. I felt that right now of like, no, no, no. <laughs> don't embalm yet, wait, just wait. <laughs> but it's done. She's embalmed, the fluids are out, the evidence is gone. She has been washed, whatever was is now gone. And now she's been embalmed. <sighs> My observations from chapter five. Arena fended off the reporters and initially kept Ted Kennedy's statement from them. Two, Arena talked with Rosemary. She had a muffled conversation and she had a wary, quavering voice. But he didn't realize that she knew until it was too late and he didn't get a chance to talk to her. Ted Kennedy's statement is questionable and they already see it immediately after the senator leaves and really before. You remember he was already being asked like, Senator, I have some questions. And he's like, I, I'm not answering any questions. The medical examiner decides no autopsy and nobody presses him for it. So that decision stands. 
Free is shocked by that decision. That's the mortician. He is shocked. He delays. He keeps back embalming fluid as long as he can until the call comes in from the funeral home. He keeps thinking they'll change the order. Kopechny's parents had called for the body to go to Pennsylvania ASAP, and therefore, Mary Jo Kopechny was embalmed. That's chapter five. Chapter six. At 2.15 p.m., Arena logged another call from George Killen. Concerned about an autopsy request from Dr. Mills, Killen wanted Arena's opinion. Arena says, well, that's up to the medical examiner. It's not my say-so. He saw no reason to question the finding of death by drowning. To the best of my observation, nothing else was wrong. Killen was satisfied to leave the case in Arena's hands. He says, you've got a tiger by the tail, Jim, but I'm sure you can handle it. <laughs> this far into the investigation, I'm like, oh, uh. I, I mean, I want to say I do believe that Jim Arena is still operating with good intentions, but they are naive intentions. And it kind of surprises me that he's this naive for having been a seasoned police officer. I wonder if the time in this little vacation town has like dulled his sense of what needs to be urgent because he does not seem to be moving with purpose through this at all. He keeps having realizations too late. They dawn on him too late. And he's not recognizing that and saying, guys, I think I need some assistance here. I need somebody else to have a clear look at this case and help me make good decisions because I'm kind of flustered. I've been in and out of the water. I've been in and out of the office with the senator and I need some assistance. He doesn't do that. Lorena is still waiting for permission to release Senator Kennedy's statement. He's got an increasingly impatient core of reporters standing outside the police station and CBS News correspondent Ben Silver and a television crew invade the office. He is an aggressive takeover reporter. He brushes aside Arena's protests and he is determined to interview this police chief. More and more reporters are coming in. There had been word that got out around 9 a.m. So really fast word is being given to the Boston Herald Traveler and other newspapers that one of Ted Kennedy's secretaries had been killed on Martha's Vineyard. So they're already on the ferries. This is interesting. One of the reporters actually ended up with Huck Look's father, Christopher Look Sr., as his taxi operator on his way to Edgartown. So what are the odds? I don't know what the odds are. <laughs> Maybe it's just such a small interconnected place that this is just going to happen. But we've already, I think this is our second father-son duo that we've already met and we're barely into the book. Uh, we had the 16-year-old ferry worker and one of the local reporters who were a son and a father. And now we have, look, the special police officer who had seen Kennedy's car the night before and his father, who's a taxi operator, giving a ride to one of the reporters. He says, you hear on the Kennedy thing? Look tells him you should talk to my son. He knows a lot about that situation. So that's already been communicated. They've already been talking by phone, apparently. Look pulls up onto the curb when he spots his son, Huck Look, on the sidewalk. He introduces the journalist to his son and says, tell him what you told me about the accident over at Chappie. Huck backs away because he recognizes this is a reporter. He says, I'm not saying a GD word. Look joins a group of locals and he is so solemn that the Edgartown attorney asks him, what do you know about all this, Huck? More than I want to know, Look said. So I don't know if this is self-imposed or if there's more that he knows. I think he's having a big like gulp moment. He's clearly talked to his dad and told him like he knows all about it is what his dad says but he is not talking to reporters and he's not talking to the city attorney. When Broadhurst gets out of his taxi, he says, you ought to go down and talk to the young Ferrer. So the first reporter to talk to the driver who had recovered the body from Poochapond Pond is this man Broadhurst. He had been brought in on this taxi by Look's dad. He had initially talked to Huck Look, but he backed away and said, I'm not saying a word. He gets down to the turf and tackle shop and finds Ferrer. We're given this information by Leo Demore. Ferrer had been diving since he was 15 and was a real enthusiast, technically knowledgeable and articulate to the point of compulsion. So Ferrer is a good diver who knows his stuff. 
Pharaoh was eager to discuss the recovery of the body he had found in eight feet of water in the back seat of Senator Kennedy's Oldsmobile. This is Farrah talking, quote, she was in what I call a very conscious position. Her head was at the floorboards where the last bit of air would have been. It seems likely she was holding herself into a pocket of air to breathe. There had been no air in the car when Farrar reached the body. Quote, if an air bubble had been there earlier, her moving about would have dispersed it, but she could have been alive a good while after the car went off the bridge. How long? Farrar couldn't say. He had read about persons trapped in submerged automobiles who had survived up to five hours by breathing a pocket of air. Farrar thought if he had been called soon after the accident, quote, there was a good chance the girl could have been saved. I just want to point out at this point that this was actually probably happening about the time that Ted Kennedy is giving his statement or just after this little conversation between Broadhurst and Farrar. But the wheels of the scandal are already past what Ted Kennedy can control. Information is already out. It's being put out. Broadhurst goes back to town hall and a reporter that says a big story was about to come out of Arena's closed door police station. Ted Kennedy was rumored to be the driver of a car in which the young secretary had been killed. A woman he didn't know in the corridor said, this won't see the light of day. This will all be covered up. So that's the perspective. But word of the accident was already beginning to seep out. So you can see the perspective of insiders who say, this is gonna be covered up. This won't see the light of day, it's Kennedy. But there's already too many pieces that are making their way into the public knowledge. A bulletin went out around 1 p.m. This is a front page bulletin by the Cape Cod Standard Times. Bulletin, Edgar Town. The body of a young woman believed to be a secretary for Senator Edward M. Kennedy was recovered from the waters of Chappaquiddick Island following an auto accident. It was not immediately determined if the woman was alone in the car. Some members of the Kennedy family are on the island for the annual Edgar Town Regatta. So that's the bulletin that went out. And I just kind of want to point out from this, as I read that, sometimes modern readers like Maureen Callahan in her book, she faulted people for taking what she called a passive voice, like the car went off the bridge rather than Ted Kennedy drove the car off the bridge. But I want to point out that this kind of reporting is not nefarious. At this point, it was only word of mouth that Ted Kennedy was the driver. And this was the initial report. And it doesn't necessarily line up at all that Ted Kennedy had to be the driver. What is known is the secretary went off. It doesn't even say, because at this point they didn't know for sure, whose vehicle it was. These reporters did not know. And so I just wanna point out, not every headline that references young secretary, the name was not known, and not every report that uses the passive voice that a car went off a bridge, not every report is nefarious. Not everyone is trying to erase Mary Jo's identity. It doesn't have to be personal if they're going off of this information. And also it doesn't have to be that they're covering up information because they don't mention that Ted Kennedy was the driver. Number one, that wasn't known yet. Um, it wasn't, it hadn't been released, but this is what was known. And so we just need to, as we see old headlines and kind of can get judgy about like woman goes off bridge in Ted Kennedy's car, that can feel like oh, that's so much absolution in that headline, but it, it very well could be that they were trying to stick with the absolute known facts or that they had gotten information before her name was known and before Ted Kennedy's statement had been released. At 2.45 p.m., an urgent message was addressed to the director of the FBI in Boston. Quote, on this day, Dominic J. Arena, Chief of Police Edgartown, 
Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, advised body of female found in overturned car in water. Tentatively identified as above was secretary to former Senator Robert F. Kennedy. Chief Arena confidentially states that the driver of the automobile was Senator Edward M. Kennedy, who was uninjured. Stated fact, Senator Kennedy was driver, is not being revealed to anyone. So he's putting the FBI on alert. Reporters do not yet know. The observations I have from this chapter are just that the wheels of information in America are already churning. Even though Arena has kept reporters out, this reporter hasn't even had to go into the police station to start getting his story from first Huck Look, who would not talk to him, but then the diver Farrar. He was willing to talk and he gave clear information about what he had found. So the, the information is already out of Ted Kennedy's control and it's also already unbeknownst to Jim Arena outside of his control as well. So we're on to chapter seven. Bernie Flynn, remember he's the state police detective lieutenant in Cape Cod, the office of the DA. He was amazed at the scene of confusion at Edgartown Police Station when he greeted a harried Arena. Remember, Arena has been in this heightened state of anxiety and stress that is abnormal for him. So he is still displaying abnormal to him behavior. Normally, he was a cool, placid guy. He's harried right now. He wasn't surprised to see a representative of the DA's office there. And Bernie Flynn observes, he's probably relieved. Like if anything too heavy comes up, the DA's office is there to take the weight off of his shoulders. That's the usual reaction a local police chief has when he's onto something big. He's thinking, okay, this is where I can get off the hook. So Flynn comes in and he reads Ted's report. Personally, I thought it was BS, he said later, but at the time he kept his disbelief to himself. Quote, as far as I'm concerned, it's an automobile accident. I'm not involved. I'm there so Dennis can say, somebody from my office is on the case. Only we aren't on the case. Nobody said, let's go and investigate this thing. Consider taking over. So I'm just standing back in the background. I'm not getting in the way of whatever Arena's game plan is. I just backed off to let him run the investigation. So the DA's office is there, but Arena is still the man in charge. The DA has no authority. He's not taking authority. Flynn was careful to avoid displaying his presence too conspicuously to local reporters who might recognize him. So he goes over to a small DA's office at the courthouse to kind of get out of the way. He had no emergency to report, and in his judgment, the case wouldn't amount to anything. Flynn, this is interesting. Flynn discerns the truth pretty quick in his mind. He says he doubted Ted would even be brought to court on a charge of leaving the scene. Quote, because he had covered himself in the report saying he was exhausted and in a state of shock. And the law was vague on how long you had to report an accident. And Kennedy did finally report the thing. So that's Flynn's assessment is he's probably going to get off on this. This is not going to be something that gets him. And in his opinion, Arena is in way over his head. He says, my impression was that he wanted to help Ted Kennedy, but he didn't know how to go about it. He didn't know what the hell to do with the case. He was trying to get out of doing anything. Well, now Walter Steele, who is the special prosecutor, he calls him and Steele had reviewed the medical examiner statutes. And he says, maybe we should think about doing an autopsy. Walter Steele calls George Killen and starts to say, you know, I've reviewed the medical examiner statutes and quote, maybe we should think about doing an autopsy. You know what they say, when in doubt, do an autopsy. And he says the drowning was just because she had been found in a submerged car, but it was sensitive to misinterpretation. So maybe we should just go on and do it and, and cover ourselves here. But Killen was not enthusiastic about the idea because Dr. Mills was satisfied there had been no evidence of foul play. So Steele abruptly ends the conversation and says, okay, we've covered all the bases. The DA has been notified. An autopsy has been suggested. It's our case to do with what we think is best. 
Steele is unhappy with the decision, but he's blaming it all on Kennedy. He says, this is a terrible position he's put us in. He's come in, he's left a statement, took off. He, we have a motor vehicle death here and we're the ones sitting here holding the bag. This is a, appalling behavior. Arena is, y'all, I feel like this is so naive and it's hard to believe that this is a seasoned police officer, but he's mystified why he has not yet received permission to release the statement. The press had grown clamorous and Arena didn't blame them. The more that he thought about the accident and then the more that he thought about this statement, there's more questions than even the statement clears up. And Arena has increasing number of questions that he had had the opportunity to ask, but he didn't do it. And now he regrets that he hadn't. He knows this statement is not gonna satisfy the reporters. It doesn't satisfy me. And I've been sitting with this, the specifics longer than they have, and I'm already not satisfied. Later, he said, quote, if everything had been clicking, I would have interrogated him more thoroughly. But unfortunately at the time there was so much confusion and I was laboring under the idea that it wasn't going to end when he left the police station. I told myself, we'll be following up on this thing. Eventually everything will come out. We'll clear everything up. So he is operating under a very naive frame of mind. Ted Kennedy is gone. The women are gone. The investigation is past his control. Embalming is being done sometime in these hours. So the investigation is passed. Everything's going to just be cleaned up. But this is how he feels. And I just thought this is actually how I have operated at a certain point in my life when I kept believing the best about people who had displayed and given enough evidence that had I been thinking critically, I could have observed that they were not trustworthy people with good intentions. But this is how an honest person feels when they are in the mode of just believing the best about someone who has power, someone who has authority. And when a powerful person with underhand motives is using a person like that, the naive person keeps believing the best parts of whatever they have been told. And so, I've experienced that. It's an actually, it's a really humiliating position to be in later because you start to rake yourself over the coals. Like, why didn't I see X, Y, or Z? Why didn't I let these negative things that I had observed actually, if I had listened to them, why didn't I let those things balance out these best things that I was believing of the statement of intention that their actions did not match? It's such a difficult position to be in. And that is right where Jim Arena is. He's naively mystified. He has no clue why we haven't heard from the Honorable Ted Kennedy. James Reston, remember he's the reporter from the New York Times. He is the most insistent that the Kennedy statement should be released. The accident was a matter of public record, he says, to which the press had the right to view it. Reston begins suggesting that Arena is being uncooperative. And Arena goes back into his office to consult with Steele. That's the special prosecutor. They want the statement. <laughs> it's been more than three hours and nobody's called me. I'm going to release it. Steele cautioned Arena to hold off. Remember, he says everything's going to break loose when that statement is released because Ted Kennedy is admitting to being the driver. He also thought that this would give a constitutional defense to the Senator that perhaps this admission of guilt in the statement could be prejudicial to a potential jury that he could say, well, I can't even get a fair trial because the public already has heard false things or because the state preempted the case. And now there's nobody in the state who would give me a fair trial. Arena thought it over and he did not think that an automobile accident was likely to have constitutional issues attached to it. The Senator had known that reporters were outside waiting to talk to him when he sneaked out the back door. Kennedy did expect this state to be made public. So Arena is thinking, he can't say I expected my statement to be held in confidence, period. 
He can't say there weren't any reporters. There was no evidence of journalistic interest. No, there was. That's why he snuck out the back. So Arena goes out into the corridor. He signals to the reporters, quote, Senator Kennedy has given me the following statement. Arena reads it and was asked to read it a second time so that the reporters could take it all down. He was in the middle of a third recitation when he's called back into the police station. Paul Markham was on the phone. Remember, Paul Markham was Ted Kennedy's assistant that came with him to actually write the statement. Markham says, Chief, we haven't been able to get a hold of Burke or Shull. Could I ask you to hold up the statement a little bit longer? I'm sorry, Arena said, I've already released it. Oh, Markham says. Well, I had to. It's been too long a period of time. What did you expect me to do with people beating on my door? The medical examiner had diagnosed death by accidental drowning. I'm treating it strictly as a motor vehicles investigation. That's all. So he's trying to reassure Markham. I'm not going deeper with this. It's just a motor vehicle accident. I need to do it. I had to, you've waited too long. Markham hung up before Arena could even ask when Senator Kennedy expected to get back to him. So Arena had little beyond the statement to give to reporters. The Senator had been quote, cooperative, end quote, considering the strain he was under. That was Arena's assessment. Quote, he must have been in a state of shock after the accident, end quote. He also said that his own efforts to dive down against the strong tidal current at Poochapon had exhausted him. Quote, and I think I'm a pretty good swimmer, end quote. Steele, who remember has been in the back, he's the special prosecutor who did not think the statement should have been advised. He comes up next to the police chief and he says, don't do any more talking. So he can see, look, you should not be playing into this situation. Just let the facts, if you've already done this, put out the statement, but then back off. On his way home, Harvey Ewing, remember he is the father of the 16 year old ferry worker. He is the bureau chief of a local newspaper, Harvey Ewing. He recollected his observations of Senator Kennedy at the Edgartown dock, quote, I'd watched him closely and his movements were completely normal. My impression was he looked in good shape. At that point, I didn't know he had been the driver of the car or had done all the things he said he did in the statement. It was a complete mystery the more I thought about it. The biggest mystery was, what the hell had he been doing for 10 hours until he reported the accident? To add to the puzzle, Ewing's son reported he had taken Ted Kennedy over and back on the on time and asked him if he knew about the accident an hour before the Senator reported it. Obviously, Ted Kennedy had not, as he said, quote, immediately contacted the police. So we're given the perspective from Ewing that I thought his movements were completely normal. I had seen him. He's the one who took the photo. I had seen him. I'd observed his movement. He looked in fine shape. And my son had taken him across. He'd had this 30 plus minute conversation and back. So there had been at least one hour delay from his, quote, immediately contacting the police. That's Ewing's assessment. He's putting events together. These immediate eyewitnesses are doing their own mental investigation. And these things only raise more questions for us. Leo DeMore notes for us though, that the regatta that was being held that weekend commonly brought in outsiders and Accidents and incidents similar to this were not completely unheard of. The invasion of sailors and excitement multiplied the opportunities that people had for, quote, high-spirited mischief. And he's thinking about this. Ewing knew from experience, quote, you could count on at least a dozen people getting into trouble during most regatta weekends, minor stuff like drunken disorderly conduct, assaults, and sleeping on the beach. But Demore notes, this accident at Chappaquiddick went beyond the standard rowdiness of race week. Ewing, who's an investigative reporter, remember he's the bureau chief of a local newspaper, he begins gathering details on the accident. Here is the essence of the story as he sees it. Quote, basically it was Ted Kennedy had driven a car off a bridge and some woman is dead, end quote. 
He also notes that the larger implications of the accident had not registered yet. He didn't know whether or not Ted Kennedy could be cited for any of this. Arena had said nothing about filing charges. But Ewing is serving some small radio stations as their voice on the scene. He is giving what he knows for a period of hours. And so at first he says, quote, they wanted anything I could give them. So he uses the same copy for an hour or two. He's giving the same information to this radio station, then communicating this to this one and then et cetera. But quote, then if I heard something new that I thought was important, I would add it in and delete something else. So he's updating his information as he's speaking to these various radio stations. And he's picking up tidbits from out of town reporters and his dining room has turned into basically a press headquarters for this event. Little information is being updated, but generally he's just giving this information over and over again and trying to stay up to date as the man on the scene. One of the first people to arrive at Ewing's house was a man named Cornelius Hurley. He was from the Boston Bureau of the Associated Press and Hurley had actually had access to the Kennedys for a long time. It says he had privileged access. He was able to reach a source in the Kennedy compound at Hyannisport. That source asked not to be identified. So we haven't yet really gotten to the men in suits that have gathered at Kennedy's house in Hyannisport. We know that Kennedy himself went, but we haven't yet seen that scene. And Hurley was told that Senator Kennedy, quote, was still in a state of shock and unable to hold a press conference to discuss the accident. So our chapter seven observations are, Arena is still in a state of shock. He again is yielding to pressure. Finally, he yields to the pressure of the reporters. Another thing we note is that everyone who reads the statement does not believe it's true. And they find that it contradicts their own observations. So everyone who reads it walks away with more questions. It does not quell any concerns. And in fact, it raises them. Another thing that we wanna note is that Flynn and Killen both seem naive. They are not seeing clearly what's happening yet. Steele, the special prosecutor, does seem to be seeing clearly. He sees constitutional issues at play. He sees far-reaching legal implications. And he's the one, remember, who goes up to Arena and says, quit talking, pull back, come on. Newspaper man Harvey Ewing is noticing details. And now Senator Kennedy is cloistered and unreachable in that Kennedy Hyannisport home. We're gonna leave our reading there. We've gotten through chapters five through seven. But what we have found is now the investigation has spun out of control. Information is out to reporters. People on the scene have gotten firsthand information from the diver. The various legal mechanisms have begun to spin on the side of the state and the local police department. We see naiveness happening, but we also see people asking questions and starting to really already identify, this is a big story, it's gone beyond where we thought. I wanna ask you guys, what do you think about Chief Arena, his actions? Remember, he is a matter of hours, even when he's finally talking to the reporters at two something, he is six hours in or so, five, six hours in to a nightmare situation that has invaded his sweet little vacation town like we talked about from that first episode. What do you think about the dropping of the ball of not interviewing Rosemary Keogh, not pressing for more information, and also remember that show four that was sitting around and willing, probably willing to talk at least accessible to the police chief, and he could have at least tried. He didn't. I'd like to hear from you. So the investigation is underway. I'm looking forward next time to getting into, we have eight, nine, 10, 11. These chapters are gonna give us more of a look at what is happening at the Kennedy compound, what they are doing to try to, from their side of things, control this situation. So that's what we're gonna get into next.
please like, subscribe, and share this video. If you have a friend who perhaps lived through these events or maybe has just expressed interest in political things, this could be a fun conversation. So share these videos with people that you think might be interested. It would bless me and it will also build up our community. I've been so, so blessed by the way you guys add your insights in the comment section. Many of you corrected me on the last video that the description that Mary Jo's body was given was entirely medical, something I didn't know, but the minute you guys said it, I was like, oh, that makes so much sense. So I love that you guys bring those kind of corrections and information to me, and you're not demeaning to me, but you do help me have better information and know more of what's going on. So I love that about our community. I hope you'll join those comments section because that a lot is happening down in the comments. So y'all have a great day. I'm so grateful for you.